Or amen. <laughs> okay. If you turn book of Galatians with me this morning, Father, I pray, Lord, for the gift of teaching. This is your holy word. This is your word. And I pray that you'd give me the wisdom I need, discernment and understanding as we open this book. In thy name I pray, amen. All right, now, if you have your Bibles, you've got the book of Galatians. Turn to the last chapter of the book of Acts. Get that in one hand, Galatians 1 and the other. The last chapter of the book of Acts. Remember, I, I don't know when it was. Dates run together for me, but I told you that the book of Acts is the New Testament book about the history of the church. Because it's the early history of the church. It's a historical book. And it has a narrative. It follows from the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 all the way until the last chapter in chapter number 28. And if you look at chapter number 28 of Acts, here's what it says. Verse number 23. And when they had appointed him a day... There came many to him and to his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. He quotes the scripture now, and he quotes Isaiah 6. He says, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known, now, quoting the scripture, now he's making a declaration. He's declaring something. And this is a powerful statement he's making. This is not something that just someone out of the clear blue can stand up and say. Because this is a dispensational, what we call paradigm shift. In plain words, the whole direction of the gospel now is headed in a different direction. Look at verse 28. Be it known, therefore, to you. That the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he'd said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And you ought to read, uh, I've got a book by, uh, he's written by really an unbelieving Jew. Uh, he's the one who publishes the biblical archaeologist. can't think of his name, but it's called Rabbinic Judaism. And it goes back to the first and second and third centuries after the church was founded for second search first second third centuries and he goes into detail about the uh, debates that the Jews had with the early Christians and it's quite a thing when you can see how that the Jews fully aware of who Christ was that he'd come and all of that but they were arguing against him and the early Christians were using the scriptures and in every case in every last case they won the argument the Christians did Notice what it says. And be it known that the gospel is sent to the Gentiles. And when they said these things, the Jews departed, had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Now, what does he quote? He quotes Isaiah 6. Go back to Isaiah, chapter number 6. Isaiah 6. In Isaiah, chapter number 6, the, uh, you've read this, I'm sure, many times. The year that King Uzziah died, the glory of God manifest to Isaiah. He saw seraphim with his own eyes. He saw the train of the glory of God following the person of the Father. 
And here he sees in verse number 9 a prophecy going forth from the presence of God. And Isaiah receives it, and here's what he says. He said, Go and tell this people, Hear you indeed, but understand not, and see you indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their ears, hear with their ears, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. In the context of this is 700 B.C., when the Word of God was going forth, and they had... uh, they were going off into captivity. They were, pre- they, they were being prepared for 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And they had rejected the truth. And so therefore God raised up prophets for them while they were in captivity. He brought them back out. He prophesied to them through Ezekiel. He prophesied to them, uh, uh, to them through Zechariah, Malachi, uh, the, the, what we call the minor prophets, to come back, build the temple, and come back and restore the priesthood and your worship of God. That's all here in this prophecy, but the prophecy goes further than that. This is one of those prophecies in the Bible that is not fulfilled, or not filled, let's not take that back, not filled full, okay? It's fulfilled partially, but not completely, because now we have New Testament writers quoting the same prophecy and making applications in their time, 700 years later. That's the thing about Scripture you've got to watch for. It's very important to understand that. You'll have somebody come along and say, well, this prophecy was fulfilled at such and such a time. Not necessarily. It might have partially been fulfilled. You remember the one where Jesus, our Lord Jesus, was called up out of Egypt and he came back into the land after the death of Herod? Do you remember that? Do mm-hmm. you remember that? Do you remember the prophecy that he quoted? I shall call my son or I call my son out of Egypt. Well, the prophecy was applied the first time to where Israel came up out of Egypt. That was a prophecy that applied to Israel, the the people coming up out of Egypt and going into the land. But it wasn't filled full. Because Egypt coming up out of the land as his son, as the son of the Lord, was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the prophecy, therefore, was not completely filled full until the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God Himself, came up out of Egypt and came into the land. So you see how prophecy works. You've got to watch it. The Bible said the Word of God is quick. It's a living thing. So what we have here in the book of Acts is the quotation of a scripture that has to do with Israel being taken off into bondage again, being blinded, being darkened, just like they were for that 70 years of captivity. They were blinded. They were sent off. They were sent away. And God gave them the light through men like Daniel. He gave them the light through Ezekiel. He gave them light through Zechariah and the prophets. But here they are being carried off again into blindness because they have rejected the Messiah. And because they've rejected him, the Apostle Paul goes back and he quotes that very same scripture in Isaiah chapter number 6 that applied when it was written 700 B.C. He takes that, pulls it out, and pulls it into the future and says, now here it is again. The heart of these people is waxed gross. Their eyes cannot see. Their ears cannot hear. And so I have hardened them. I have blinded them. And I have judged them. And then when you read in Romans chapter number 11, you find that. That's exactly what happens. So Israel, as a corporate body, now this is important, not as individual Jews, but as a corporate body, has been blinded. Right now, they are not the head of the nations. Right now they are not the light of the world. Right now they are not the apple of God's eye. Right now as a corporate body they have come back to the land in unbelief. And they are, they are, they are living in their... To, <laughs> look at them. They're having to fight for every square inch they've got. You've got these so-called Palestinians, an absolute creation that did not exist, brought up from nothing. You've got these Palestinians who lay claim to some of the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And so the situation as it stands today is exactly where it ended in Acts chapter number 28. He blinded them and he sent them into captivity. In other words, spiritual captivity. That's where they are. And when you read the book of Romans chapter number 11, the apostle Paul said, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they may be saved. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And here in Romans 11, you find them blinded. You find them cut off. You find the natural olive tree cut off. Didn't say destroyed. It said cut off. Don't read into the text what it doesn't say. 
got to be careful with the wording. Cut off, but it doesn't say anything about him being destroyed. And uh, look at it in Romans chapter number 11. Because this is the issue and the burden of the apostles. You think the apostle Paul loved his people? Well, of course he did. You think he had a burden for his people? He said in the book of Romans, plainly, I'd be accursed of God. I'd be cursed from God. Be cursed. Anathema. For my people. But Romans 11, verse 1. I say, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I'm also an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. Then, of course, he goes on through the whole thing. And that, that's a beautiful chapter. The 11th chapter of Romans. If I, if, I, if, I, if I could say anything to a young Christian, I'd say there are certain chapters in the New Testament you need to get into and you really need to get a hold of it because it'll help you, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. And Romans 11 is one of them. It's one of them. It is a very important. And then I'd say get into the book of Galatians because Galatians is very, very important. And then go to the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. Read that, pray over it, study it, meditate over it. Take it into your heart and your soul. And then go over there in Acts chapter number 10, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Those three, four chapters in the heart of the book of Acts. It tells you how God changed over from the Jews and began to focus toward the Gentiles. And he called an apostle to them. That's why I told you before, they hate Paul. They hate Paul. They're all over the internet. They got their garbage up. And well, folks, listen, these people are not your Christian brothers and sisters. Any man that'll get up in your face and tell you that the apostle Paul is a heretic, and that he was and that, that he was a self-appointed apostle and had no business writing the scripture, that person has attacked your Bible. I don't know how to say it any plainer. You might as well just rip these books out of the Bible and throw them away. And what authority do people like that have to attack the credentials of the apostle Paul? Makes me mad, man. And don't rub around me like you're my brother and my sister. You're not. When you tear up my Bible and throw it out and stomp on it, you're not my brother and sister. I don't know your God. <laughs> That's the same way with this crap, this Mandela effect crowd. I got an email from one the other day. Boy, did they excoriate me. <laughs> I just got up the other day and said a few words about the Mandela effect. And, you know, this Mandela effect is that you can't believe what you're reading because it's all been changed. It's the same thing. If you change it, rip it out. That's what Jehudi did in the Old Testament. Took a penknife and just cut it out and threw it on the fire. Folks, I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow. The church is here today and gone tomorrow. Whatever you crowd you belong to, whatever social, whatever, whatever politic, well, it's just you're here today and you're gone tomorrow. But the word of God is eternal. Amen. This book right here is forever. Amen. You can get up and preach and mess up and preach the wrong doctrine and blah blah blah, but the book. Leave alone. <laughs> because this is for my grandchildren and for my great-grandchildren and for my great-great-grandchildren. Don't mess with the book. And there's a warning in the book of Revelation. It said, you take something out of this book, what's God going to do to you? <laughs> Amen. Didn't mean to get preaching. Can't help it. <laughs> Sometimes that stuff just gets to me. I mean, this arrogant devil somewhere, I forget where it was. I shouldn't even be giving them the time of day. But boy, did they ever lay into me about the Mandela effect. You're wrong, preacher. It has been changed. And I like to say back, what authority? What is your authority for anything changed? Would you know a manuscript if you saw one? They never read it before. They never read it before. The wolf and the lamb, the wolf and the lion. That's a classic case of the Mandela effect. Everybody believes that the wolf shall, or the, the, the lamb shall lie down with the, with, the, with, with the lion, right? Lamb and lion. You see it all the time. It's a beautiful logo. But what does it say in Isaiah chapter? The wolf. Well, they say, you see, it's in the consciousness of the people that it's a lion. So the people know the truth that it's a wolf, li that it's a lamb lying down with a lion. So somebody must have changed the text from where it was originally. That's how that works. It's ridiculous. And the truth. I wouldn't I don't trust people. I don't trust myself. I don't trust you as far as I could throw you. <laughs> I trust the Lord. Amen. I get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and says, You dirty, low down, sorry dog. I'm looking right at you. 
The only good thing about you is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right inside my soul. I believe in Him. Amen. Get out of my face. <laughs> You'll be better off. You'll be better off. <laughs> Just quit trusting yourself. But this generation, you can't talk to them. So when the Apostle Paul tells them the book of Acts, chapter number 28, he says to them, God's going to blind you, He's hardening you, and He's setting you aside. Now, that's quite a statement, because here the Apostle Paul is saying, we've got Gentiles and we've got Jews. He never, ever muddled or confused the issue. You're a Gentile, you're a Jew. The Apostle Paul, of all apostles, was the one who stood up face to face, eyeball to eyeball, with all the Jewish leaders of his day and said, now you hold on. That Gentile right there has just as much right in the body of Christ as you do. And you are not Lord over him. And when he comes into the body of Christ, he is made just as righteous in the blood of Christ as you are. Amen. And that Gentile is just as received and has just as holy a place in the body of Christ as you do. And the Jews didn't like that. And they kept coming at him and sniping at him and sniping at him and sniping at him. And this is what he gets into in Galatians. Because they come across as pious and holy. Brethren, we love you. Oh, how we love to, we'd love to have fellowship with you. But there are just a few things we'd like to talk about. Now, we need to, we need to, we need to discuss these. They're just minor spiritual issues, but we, we need to talk about them. And they come across as pious and holy, like they care for you. Listen, folks. The Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, and on the cross, God reconciled man to himself. And you cannot add one thing to what he did, and you cannot take away one thing to what he accomplished. It was finished. When he said to Telestai, he meant it's completed, accomplished, finished, and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. And then when some charismatic comes along and tells you that he had to die then and his soul had to go into hell. And then when he was down there in hell, he had to beat the demons off. And down there in hell, he had to, he had to, he had to defeat the powers of hell in order to accomplish your atonement and your salvation. And that when he arose from the dead, when he arose from the grave and he came up out of hell, that was his day of power and authority over the power of hell. And that sounds good to the unlearned. But folks, there's something big, there's something that's mighty wrong with that. And that is this. Works, even the flesh of Christ, cannot save your soul. Even His good works and perfect life will not save your soul. It takes the blood that was shed on the cross. That is is what saves your soul. He said to them in John chapter number 6, and he gave them this illustration. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part in me. All right? Now that's quite a simple statement. They said, how in the world can we understand this? This is too hard a saying. How can we eat his flesh and drink his blood? Well, let me ask you a question this morning. How could you eat his flesh and drink his blood? Because 2,000 years ago, his flesh died on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day and ascended the Father. His flesh is not on this earth. His flesh is at the right hand of the Father. His blood was shed and he entered into the presence of God with his blood. How are you going to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Catholic says, I've got the answer. The Roman Catholic says, Ah, so... Don't you understand that we have a priesthood? We have priests. We minister the sacraments. We minister salvation. We minister the blood and we minister the flesh. Therefore, when you come and you take of the mass, you are eating the flesh and you are drinking the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how does that work, Mr. Priest? Well, it's very simple. By our authority and command... When we wave our hand and say our words and burn our incense, that we have literally turned that wafer into the body of Christ and that wine into the blood of Christ. 
and you are eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That is your salvation. And so they line up and they come up before the priest and they stick their tongue out and he puts that wafer on her tongue and they take the wafer. They have received the body of Christ. But for some strange reason, the priest doesn't give them the blood. He drinks the wine. You ever notice that? Have you ever watched it? He drinks the wine. He, no, he's standing right before them and he has denied them the blood covenant. But do you know why he does that? Because he's a priest. He's the one who takes the blood and applies the blood. Because he has usurped the office of the Old Testament priest who took the blood and he applied the blood. So what have you done? You've taken an Old Testament type, you've turned it around, and you've made it into a so-called Christian rite where people come to the priest and the priest is their door of salvation. Because they teach their Catholics that if you are excommunicated from this church and you cannot take of this wafer and this blood, then you are condemned to hell and you have no hope. And this is how you hold people, you hold them, you, you bind them up. You, they're afraid, they're scared to death that, that if they're excommunicated, then there's no hope for them that they're going to hell. I have not misrepresented them one time. The term for that is transubstantiation. Transubstance, substantial, physical, of, of essence, trans, to bring it over from one place into another. Transubstantiation. And so the priest holds their very soul in his hand. No, sir, mister, you don't hold my soul in your hand. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. The Lord Jesus finished up John chapter number 6 by saying this, The words, the words that I say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Not the flesh of the Son of God, but the words. They drove nails through his flesh and nailed him to a cross. Amen. And the Bible said he made his body an offering for sin. Thou shalt see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It took the blood covenant. Why is that important? It's important because the liberal teaches you that all you have to do is to live like Christ lived. To feed, to feed the hungry, to take care of the, of the sick, to do good works, to emulate him. To be Christ-like. I mean, you hear this ad nauseum. You hear it all the time. The bottom line is that you, you know, your salvation is earned through a lifetime of being like Christ. You know, this is Christ-like people. That's what they call them, Christ followers. Be careful of terminology. Sometimes I follow Him and sometimes I go my way. How many of you agree with that this morning? Following Christ is not what saves your soul, folks. He that hath the Son hath life. You're not saved by His life that He lived on this earth. This is such an earth-shattering and shaking thing to these, to these people today. Well, if you're not saved by His life, what are you saved by? His death. His death. He had to die. And if he, had not, if he had not died, then there would be no Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Such a thing. Such a thing. And Israel, Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse 4, the Shema, Hear you, all Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. So they stand on that and they reject the Son. They reject the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If I go to a Jew today, he's blinded. Why is he blinded? He's blinded according to Acts 28. Why is he blinded? Because God loves him. Has he cast away his people which he foreknew? God forbid. What God does with the Jews between God and the Jew. But I know this, the Jew one day is going to give an account to God for the shedding of the blood of the Lamb of God. They're going to give an account. They're going to come face to face with him. The Bible, uh, when it deals with issues like this, it gets right down to the point. And the point is very simple. The Jew right now is blinded. You can sit down with a Jewish rabbi and he'll talk to you. He'll open up the Bible and talk to you. And uh, then you 
get a little deeper into the Scripture and he'll run to the Talmud. And the Talmud becomes his foundation for his faith. The Talmud. The Talmud. 2,000 years ago, when Christ was here, the Talmud in written form did not exist. But the Talmud had already started in creation by 70 B.C. as far as men memorizing it. Young men 2,000 years ago, folks, it may be hard for you to believe this, but they could quote vast portions of the Talmud as it existed at that time. Judaism teaches right now, at this moment, they teach that there's a oral law and a written law and that the written law is for you Gentiles and the unlearned to read. This is what you got in your hands. This is the written law. But the oral law that was given to Moses at Sinai was never written down. And the oral law given to Moses at Sinai became the basis for this greater understanding of God and the Talmud. The Talmud is based not on the written law, but the oral law. This is why the Lord 2,000 years ago said to them, you've made the word of God of none effect by your traditions. You run back to your, to your, to your oral law, your traditions. How many ever heard of the... Uh, uh, What's it called? The uh, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. I'm trying to remember. Sometimes you can't remember all this stuff when you get into some of this. But the uh, <coughs> oh, it's a it's a commentary on the scripture that dates all the way back to right after uh, right after Moses. And uh, the uh, I'll think of it in a minute. It's uh, and, and and it's important to know that. Even after they wrote the scripture, even after Moses wrote it, that, uh, that these people had already begun to build within themselves this spiritual elitism. You know what the, uh, you know what the Kabbalah is? The Kabbalist, the Jew? Did you know that it's, it's fashionable today out here in Hollywood? I've always, rem- it's, always, it's always been a marvel to me how that somebody who's never themselves, they're always acting... And they think for some reason that qualifies them to comment on anything. And most of them, when they're not acting, I don't like them. (laughs) I like their characters a whole lot better than the real one. Yeah. But, you see, the the, uh, Kabbalah, if you've ever read anything about it, the Sephora, that's the Tree of Life. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The Kabbalah, all right? Have you ever looked at it? Have you ever looked at Theosophy? Have you ever looked at Blavatsky's Theosophy? Over there in the, in the early 1900s? Look at her tree of life. Look at her tree of life. And look at the tree of life of the Kabbalah. They're almost identical. Look at the names that are used. They're almost identical. Look at the whole concept. It's almost identical. But here's the problem. Kabbalism or the Kabbalah is supposed to be mystic Judaism. Helen Blavatsky in Theosophy is pure occultism. What's going on here? Don't you think that's an issue? If you've got something that is absolutely purely occultic, and you take it and compare it with something that's supposed to be in some form or fashion connected with the Bible, and yet they are practically identical, you know what that tells me? They've got a common source. And what's the common source? The common source is the source of Plato and Monad and all the rest of it. Back there to occultism all the way back, 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 back. And has nothing to do with the Word of God. That's the shame and the sorrow of it. Yes. The Mishnah is a commentary on the Talmud. The Gemara, the Mishnah, the tractates. The Talmud is broken up into sections. The Talmud is a commentary on the Scripture and it has a commentary on the commentary of the commentary of the commentary. This is why you have 15 rabbis that will sit down and they'll argue about how many angels you can get on the, on, the, on, the, on the end of a needle. Or what shape did a demon take? Or how big is a demon? And how many demons are there? What are all the names of the demons? 
And if I take a drink of water on the Sabbath day, will it have demons in the water? Or if I eat this food and it's not fully cooked the way it ought to be, is there a demon in that? Is there a demon under a rock that looks like that? You would not believe the arguments that you get into when you start reading that. And I've read this stuff. And one of the greatest sources on it that I have found on the Talmud is the life and times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. How many ever heard of Edersheim? All right. I recommend that book. Highly recommend it. About that thick. You can get it in CD-ROM form today. You can get it in Bible programs. And just go to the back and read what they say about demons. And you'll be amazed. And it's, and it's, and it's a wonderful thing to read it. Here's why. When you read what they say about demons and compare it with what the New Testament says about demons, there's no comparison. They get off into a wild, speculative, affected by the occultism of their day, just like the Kabbalah. They get off into all of this stuff. You can see where they don't have a common source. Their authority is not the Bible. Their authority is all this junk around them. What keeps the church right? What keeps us right? What keeps us, what keeps us separated from every wild spiritual thing that comes through? The Bible. The Bible. Here's the thing. If the Bible that you hold in your hand right there agreed with every wild, crazy, uh, 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 occultic new thing to come down the road, if your Bible agreed with all of that, I'd be worried about the book I call the Bible. You know why I'd be worried about it? Because I said, well, good night, man. This book is no different from the rest of it. It just maybe has a little Christian flavor to it, but it's, there's, no big, there's no big deal. But it is absolutely different. A demon in the New Testament is not portrayed like the demonology of rabbinic Judaism, the demonology of occultism, the demonology of witches, the demonology of pop culture. Not in the New Testament. It's a different thing. So, when you get into the Kabbalah, you get into the Sephora, you get into the Tree of Life, you look at all that stuff, you look at the Zodiac, it's attached to it, all these signs, symbols, all this stuff, you start looking at the signs and the symbols, and they're big on that stuff, believe me. You start looking at the Kabbalah, then you transfer yourself over 2,000 years into the present where we are today, and lo and behold, this symbol pops up, this sign pops up, this word pops up, here, 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 and all you got to do is to watch where it starts popping up and connect it with where it's coming from, and you'll see that it's not of the Lord. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fakery from day one. That's what's happening here in Galatians. He says to the more foolish Galatians who hath bewitched you. Who has cast a spell on you? Isn't that something? Who hath bewitched you? Look at chapter 3 verse 1. Galatians 3 1. <coughs> oh foolish uh, <coughs> Galatians. Who hath cast a spell over you? That you should not obey the truth before, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. A lot of subtlety. Heretics are subtle. Here's the way a heretic works. He will begin to undermine the truth. He'll do it incrementally with just planting just a little bit of doubt about something. That's the way he works. And he puts that in your heart and causes you to begin to question you, you don't necessarily come out against anything in the beginning, but you, all you have to do is put doubt in someone's heart that they begin to question. And here's what happens to us. This is human nature. The moment you begin to question and the moment you have doubt, you will start looking for answers. Won't you? Absolutely. You're going to start looking for answers. And if he can get you, if Satan can get you to look for answers outside of the Bible... He's got you hooked. Yes, he has. He's got you hooked. Folks, Helen Blavatsky quoted the Scripture. Satan quoted the Scripture. They quote the Scripture out there all the time. The Kabbalah quotes the Bible. But you've got to watch this. When they say God and I say God, we're not talking about the same thing. Okay? 
When they say it and I say it, two entirely different things called semantics, different meanings applied to the same word. You've got to watch this. This is why Paul said, foolish Galatians, you began in the spirit, now you're per- justified by the flesh. You have people who want to come in and they're going to say this, oh, Christ died on the cross, hallelujah, to glory to God. He's the son of God. Yes, sir, buddy. <laughs> oh, yes, he was, I was there. My, listen, Galatian believers, my first cousin was standing right there at the cross and watched him die. And my first cousin was a believer in the Lord Jesus and accepted him and so have I and God's been good to me but now since I began to study he showed me some things and he's began to lead me into deeper truths and let me show you what these are now Christ is wonderful this is our sacrifice he's our savior but we need to add just a few things to this to give us a better walk with the Lord you know you want to walk with the Lord don't you Don't you want to walk closer to the Lord? Well, you need this. For example, now circumcision was given before the law. Was it? Was circumcision given to Moses or Abraham? Circumcision was given 500 years before the law. Given to Abraham. Okay? So he'll come back to you and he'll say, see there? Circumcision not even under the law. Circumcision... Was given, to, was given to Abraham, 1900 B.C. What was it for? It was a sign of his faith and his connection, and there was something wrong with the covenant. There was something wrong with the seed. That's what circumcision represents. Abraham, there's something wrong with your seed. Is he telling the truth? Yes. Everything up until this point is the truth. So then he says to the young believer, Now, don't you realize you need to be circumcised? If you're going to be a true believer and follow Christ, you need to be circumcised. And so he goes back and he goes back before the law and he says, my goodness, Abraham, it wasn't Moses, it was Abraham. So this has nothing to do with the law. So I guess he may be right because it's me accepting the promises of God and confessing that I have, uh, there's a problem with my seed. So I'm going to go ahead and be circumcised. What's wrong with that? I'm not talking about for medical reasons. I'm talking about religious reasons. What's wrong with that? Pardon? It, absolutely. What, what's he tried to do, though? He's tried to add it. Just a little bit. He's tried to add it. Add something to the finished work of Christ. Amen. If he tries to add a day... Well, now, you know, the Sabbath day was given way before the law. Was it? Who was the Sabbath given to? Who? I mean, when was the Sabbath day? What God did? What day did God rest and what books it written in? Genesis. You ever talk to a Seventh-day Adventist, he won't take you to Moses. He'll take you to Genesis. <laughs> he'll take you way before the law. God rested on the seventh day. Shabbat, the seventh day. Day of rest. He says to you, now you see that? Man works six days, seventh day he rests. What's wrong with the day of rest? There's nothing wrong with the day of rest. Appreciate all the days of rest I can get. All right? Okay. (laughs) So, he says to you, well, you know, the Sabbath is uh, really where you stop and honor God. And you're showing the Lord that you appreciate the first fruits of your labor and all that God's done for you. And the Sabbath day is a wonderful day. And so, it really wouldn't be bad to add the Sabbath to to your Christian faith, would it? Just today. Have a problem with that? That's a good. That's that's that's. Well, here's the point. Here's I think what you're trying to say is this: that it's complete, and there's no room for anything else. So if you try to put something into it, you're going to have to remove something. That's what you're trying to say. Do you need to keep the Sabbath to be saved? What did the Apostle Paul tell them? Now, I know it's Paul. Throw him out. Get rid of this guy. I mean, he is the worst perverter of Christianity that ever lived, according to some of them. Did he not say in the book of Romans that one man esteemeth one day above another? 
Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Did he not say in the book of Colossians, Don't let any man judge you according to a Sabbath day? He did, didn't he? Then did not the writer of Hebrews tell you that there was a day, they kept that day, but there was really no rest in that day, for the rest is in Christ. Amen. That's interpreting what he said. That's our rest. Of course, that's what Sabbath means. The Lord rested. But you see how once you accept that little bit right there, and it all looks good on the surface of it, there's nothing about any of this that says don't believe on Christ. It's just adding a little bit. Just a little bit. So what do you believe, preacher? I believe Jesus Christ is salvation. I believe He's redemption. I believe He's sanctification. I believe He's mercy. I believe He's the grace of God. I believe He's the Sabbath. I believe there's no door into heaven but the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe His blood cleanses from all sin. I believe to have the Son is to have life. And if you don't have the Son, I'll count me Sabbath days you keep. You don't have life. You must be born again. And it is all the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't need anything to embellish Him. To improve on what he did. To make it look better or more palatable. What the Lord Jesus Christ did was complete, finished, perfect. It can't be added to. Amen. Our salvation is a person. A person. Now there are other things in the New Testament you might be convicted of. There may be things you want to do. Do them. But when it comes to salvation, he is it. You cannot add to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm preaching again, brother. I don't know what's going on with me here this morning. Oh, no, 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 I'll carry it away. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard for preachers to teach. They get carried away and start preaching. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. We'll pick it up again next week. Amen. <laughs> brother Bruce McLeod, dismiss us, please. My Father, thank God for this lesson. No, thank God for that word.